somebody had asked me what's my earliest memory, I had told them that as a child I recalled hiding underneath the dining room table because the sunlight faded behind a passing cloud. I was confused and upset because it was dark in the middle of the day, and I didn't understand what was going on around me. This incident got me thinking about my childhood and growing up in a small town in the Northeast. And for everyone who grew up in my hometown, you knew the story of Pastor Jessup. After all, every town has their scary stories, local folk tales. However, the tale of Pastor Jessup always felt a bit too real. There are too many details and so few variations. And when people of a certain age mention his name, they wince and tense up, as if the reality of this person were too much to deal with. I remember this decrepit house up the street from where we lived. That always terrified me. It stank of sulfur and rot. It looked half digested by the earth. There were burn marks around the doors and the windows, and they always looked into me like dark, penetrating eyes. Despite this revolting visage, I was always drawn to it, as if there were some totemic lore. Later on, I heard someone say that this is where Pastor Jessup used to live, that he was once a respected member of the community, but after an incident with some parishioners, he was forced to leave the congregation. Whatever the incident was, everybody said that he was no good, that he wasn't to be trusted, and that parents would clench their children extra hard if they ever heard utterance of his name. People say that's when he lost his mind. Some say he was poisoned. Others claim that there was mercury in the water. One woman told me that a dog drowned in his well and he drank the bad water. I remember my older brother telling me that he was mad all along and that the grief of whatever he had done consumed him, and that his mind caved in on itself. One day, during one of my many journeys, my brother accompanied me. My brother told me Pastor Jessup tore the place apart, trying to hunt down what he called shadow men who lived in between the walls. It was said that on certain nights, if you walked by Pastor Jessup's house, you could hear him screaming and crying as he hunted down his invisible enemies. I also heard that Pastor Jessup tried to take his own life, and that he did so by filling his bathtub with gasoline and setting himself on fire. Somehow, though, he had survived. After his failed attempt at self-immolation, he always wore a hood to hide his horrible disfigurements. That his face was so badly scarred, one of his eyes was seared shut, and that he could hardly breathe. People in the town went about their days as if he were an afterthought. They carried on as if they had done away with Pastor Jessup. I remember my mother actually telling me that's when the man died and the legend began, and in this case, the legend is actually much worse. We thought it was a tall tale to terrify us children, but people could see him, a hooded figure stalking the streets at night, leering into people's windows. They said that he scrawls these horrible notes in this weird archaic cipher and hides them inside of trees. And if you're unfortunate enough to find one, you're marked. And that's how he tracks you down. I remember someone telling me that he comes through your window at night. And when he takes off his hood, he's so horrible that you go into shock. I remember my mother told me that Pastor Jessup, or Pastor Jay as he came to be known, would snatch up children, good or bad, and carve out their eyes. I remember telling my brother off one day. I was angry, telling him that he was just trying to scare me with all these horrible stories. In an odd turn of character, he fell into a sober tone of voice, and he said, If you don't believe me, ask Mom. She's the only one who ever got away from him. That's why she has a sleeping sickness. Despite the jarring nature of what I heard, I found myself going back to that house again and again. I remember that day I was particularly disturbed after hearing that news about Mother. I remember as I was walking back to my house, it was as if the trees, leaves, and everything around me had eyes, like I was being watched from all over. Suddenly, I was captivated by this magnificent creature that emerged as if from nowhere. I was enamored by its glowing shell, and I stood there still for a moment, and just as it had emerged, it sauntered off. As it walked away, I noticed it left behind a white sliver at the base of the tree from where it came. I grabbed it, and as I unfolded the strange document, an awful stench overwhelmed me. 
My heart sank and my chest tightened as I realized that the strange piece of paper was one of those horrible letters from Pastor Jessup. That night, as was the case with so many before, I struggled to get to sleep. As I drifted off, I fell into an awful rabbit hole of nightmarish visions. I imagined I was inside Pastor Jessup's house. It was so vivid, so real. I could see, touch, and smell everything around me. The air was dense and pungent. I could see him, Pastor Jessup. He carried on as if I weren't there, like he was delivering some demented sermon to an invisible congregation through bouts of gurgles and wheezes. I thought he was reading from a Bible, but when I got a better view, I realized the pages bore the same scrawlings as that note I had earlier received. In a strange turn of events, I stole a glance from the other side of the room, and I saw my mother was looking in from the outside. Then all of a sudden, Pastor Jessup stopped his ranting and raving, and pointed right at me. I felt his empty, hooded face staring into me as he bellows out, The mother escaped me, but you'll do just fine, and your light is blinding. The next thing I remember is being on my back. I wasn't bound, but I couldn't move. He was wearing this filthy butcher's apron around his waist. I could hear the rattling of his rusted instruments, scalpels, scissors, and knives clattering around. As he corralled around my motionless body, all I could hear over and over was the words, look into my eyes, look into my eyes. As he loomed over me, I could feel his breath pelt me in the face, and I recognized that horrible stench that I had smelt before. Before his face emerged, I felt the impact of something thump on my back. It was like some kind of hand slapped me out of my slumber. In a strange daze, I looked around the darkness that surrounded me. I couldn't tell if I was awake. It was as if the intensity of my nightmare was so visceral and inescapable that I couldn't entertain the notion of being safe in my bed. Just as a thin veil of security began to envelop me, my stomach sank. I saw the outline of a hand through my moonlit bedroom window. In that second, I knew I was being watched by someone or something. I clenched my sheets and closed my eyes and somehow made it through the night. By some miracle, the morning sun emerged. Never had I been so happy to see the daylight. However, something was off. It was eerily quiet. I was all alone. It was as if the rest of the world had checked out and left me behind. Without provocation, I began wandering these long, lonely roads and the wind didn't blow through the air. The sun seemed to burn brighter than ever. The smell of heat and sulfur wandered into my nose as I inventoried the complete lack of any visible life. Time got away from me as I continued to stroll through the empty daylight. I stopped dead in my tracks as I was once again in front of that horrible house that I had been to so many times before. And then I looked over and I saw somebody. It was a woman. I realized that it was my mother. I almost didn't recognize her. She was wearing a long, flowing white gown with her back toward me. She kept pointing toward Pastor Jessup's basement, and in the strained voice, she told me, he wants the diamonds in your eyes. Every child has them, but yours, my son. Yours shine the brightest. I escaped him, but I can't do anything for you now. It's best if you don't struggle. I need to go back to sleep now. The vision of my mother vanished before me. I felt a clammy hand from behind cover my mouth. The sense of desperation and panic were all the more intense as I realized that I hadn't escaped the horrible clenches of this predatory monster. <laughs> He kept gurgling these awful belches of nonsensical ramblings, how he had wanted to get a hold of the light of the innocence that had slipped through God's hands, and that he was a savior acting on his mission. I tried to close my eyes as a last means resort to protect myself, but I was paralyzed. Every muscle and fiber was cold and hardened, as I had no agency in the movement of my own body. I tried to scream and shout for help, but it was impossible. It was as if some giant hand reached into my chest and wrenched the air from my lungs. I could hear him gurgling and muttering, and I couldn't make out a single word that slipped from his revolting mouth. All I could do was close my eyes, and open my mouth and try to scream, shout, whisper, or anything. All the while, I feared that this man would carve out my eyes. I feared the feeling of cold, dirty steel sliding across my eyelid, opening my retina, and what it would feel like to feel the light inside me escape this uninvited incision. I winced as I felt his cold, leathery hands skim the outside of my face. I nearly resigned to this horrible fate, and at that moment I felt something warm and fizzling behind my mouth. 
where my spine meets my head. It was this intense heat that filled me. It emerged from within, as if it were this giant roar of white static. It completely surrounded me, and in a moment I felt suspended in air, being carried away from this horrible nightmare. As I gradually emerged from this event, my vision cleared and adjusted to the nightlight of my bedroom. I realized though I wasn't safe, I recognized once again the shadow of a hand pressed against my window. And then, worst of all, the shadow of somebody's face emerged. I dared not turn around and confirm my worst fears, and yet I could not ignore the sound of this heavy breathing that was just outside the security of my home. I looked around in a profound panic. It was the same paralyzed feeling that secured me to the table of Pastor Jessup's basement. I spied a pocket knife on my nightstand, and then, in some unforeseen burst of instinctual action, I grabbed it and I drove it into the shadow of the man in the window. I heard a shriek pierce the air around me. The shriek devolved into this echoing howl as the Night Stalker's shadow melted away from my bedroom. I saw a small ribbon of blood trickle from the entry point. As I pulled my knife from the floor, it suddenly opened up into a torrent of rushing blood that washed over me. The rest is a blur. I don't know what actually happened. I looked up and saw the silhouette of a woman who I couldn't quite make out or identify. She kept saying in this light, distant voice, It's okay. Everything's gonna be alright. You're safe now. I was being cradled, and I felt the soothing voice tell me that I was running a fever, and I was thrashing around in my sleep, muttering the same four words over and over. Thank you.